Welcome everybody. Today I'm going to present a tutorial for the game of Gentis, designed by Stefan Risthaus, the designer also of Arkwright. In the game of Gentis, which is the Latin word for people or family, players are presented with a game board that, among other things, contains 28 different action tiles. The player takes an action in Gentis by first selecting an action tile, paying for it with coins and hourglasses, and then performing the action. Playing well requires that you manage your money, your time, and your other resources, and also watching what your opponents might be up to. The action tiles are assigned to five or six specific actions, and these actions are as follows. There's the scribe action here, near the bottom of the board, near where the display of cards is. The scribe, the scribe action allows you to add anywhere from one to three civilization cards to your hand. Civilization cards provide an important way for you to score points, to earn additional resources, and gain valuable abilities. Now, while there's no hand limit during most of the game, at specific times, during the game, you will be penalized if you have more than three civilization cards in your hand. Civilization cards are grouped into three different eras, and as you might suspect, era two card rewards exceed those of cards from era one, and rewards for era three cards are better than those from the two earlier eras. The Chronicler action lets you play one civilization card from your hand in order to collect its rewards. Before you can play a card from your hand, however, you have to meet the requirements of the card. A civilization card requires that you have a number of different types of people that make up your population. In the game of Gentis, there are nobles, which I'll use my mouse, mouse to indicate, there are nobles. There are artisans over here. There are soldiers. There are merchants, there are priests, and finally there are scholars. These people are organized in diametrically opposed pairs on your player board down here. As a result, your population can never hold more than six nobles and six artisans combined. Nobles are opposite artisans. Similarly, you can't have more than six soldiers and six merchants combined, and you can't have more than six priests and six scholars combined. Managing your population represents another important aspect of the game. Some civilization cards also require that you previously built one or more different types of cities on the map. In Gentis, you have the option of building trade cities, oracle cities, and temple cities, and we'll cover all those a little bit later on. The navigator action up here in the top left corner in blue is what you use in order to build a city. There are some action tiles that when taken allow you to build a specific type of city, for example, temple cities, or oracle cities, or trade cities. And there are other action tiles that allow you to build any of the three types of cities sort of like wild card action tiles, you might say. The, ph the philosopher action up here in the top right is one place you can go to increase your population by one or two types of people, and in some cases, three or more types. The tax collector action is one of several different sources of coins in the game. Remember, you need coins in order to pay for action tiles. Most of the time, the tax collector will pay you four or eight coins. But if you play your cards right, the payout can be more like 16 coins or even 24 or more. And finally, the start player action is where you go if you want to be the new start player for the next round of play. So now that we've covered the actions in general, let's peer behind the curtain to see more specifically how turns play out. Each of the six rounds of Gentis, 
you can see this is the round tracker here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two rounds assigned to, assigned to each era. So rounds one and two are part of era one, three and four are part of era two, and five and six are part of era three. And each of the six rounds consists of a heyday phase represented by the sun during which players take actions and a decline phase represented by the moon when the tiles are returned to the game board, certain card effects are resolved, and uh, other various and sundry things happen. Before the game actually begins, each player gets 20 coins to start with. And then players have the opportunity to seed their hands with two civilization cards from a display. So after a start player is chosen at random, players in reverse turn order take turns selecting cards from the display until each player has two Era 1 cards in their hands. Next, players have the opportunity to seed their player boards with four types of people. So let's take a closer look at the player board to see how this works. Here you can see, again, the three pairs of different types of people that make up your population. Nobles paired with artisans, soldiers paired with merchants, and priests paired with scholars. Your player board starts out with zero with each type of person. But as I mentioned earlier, just before the game starts, you have the opportunity to increase your population by four people. So how do you increase your population? It's simple. You, you simply slide the cubes right and left. So to increase your nobles, say, from 0 to 1, you would slide that first cube to the right. To increase your nobles from 1 to 2, you'd slide it again. And to increase your nobles a third time, slide it once more. So now I have three nobles to my name. Similarly, to increase your number of artisans from 0 to 1, or to 2, or to 3, you would slide this other cube to the left. At this point, we have a population of 3 nobles and 3 artisans, a total of 6 in that row. Recall that I said that each pair of art persons can only have a maximum combined population of 6 at any one time. So if I now wanted to increase my artisan population from 3 to 4, I would simultaneously have to reduce my noble population from 3 to 2. So now I have two nobles and four artisans instead of three of each. Let's now take a look at a typical civilization card up close. This is the Era 1 card, Shrine. In order to play this card from your hand, you need to have at least one noble, one artisan, one soldier, and one priest in your population. The requirement is that your population consists of at least this number of these types of people. You don't actually have to reduce your population by these amounts in order to play the card from your hand. Currently, we would not be able to play Shrine from our hand because while we have a sufficient number of nobles and artisans, we still don't have any soldiers or priests. Let me remedy that right now. Oh, if only it were that easy. So now we do meet the requirements of Shrine. We would then play the card face up in front of us, indicate to all the players that we, in fact, did meet the requirements of the card, and finally, we get to reap the rewards. In this case, three victory points right here, and we get to remove one cube from our time track on our player board. Our time track, what, what, what's that? The time track starts out looking like this at the beginning of the game. There are five blocking cubes here, and to the left of those, there is one single hourglass token. Let's say it was our turn and we wanted to build a city. Remember, in order to build a city, we need to take an available navigator tile from the game board. So let's say we took this one. It gets placed on our time track. This tile requires that we pay four coins to the bank and two hourglasses. 
So we pay the four coins, and we add the two hourglasses to our time track. You're probably realizing now that when the time track runs out of space, you have run out of turns for the current round. And now you see why removing a cube from the time track is such a nice reward. Let's go ahead and do that now as if we had played Shrine to our tableau. So the cube goes away and the three single hourglasses shift to the right to take up the space. And now we have four empty spaces of our, on our time track instead of only three. Action tiles require different combinations of coins and hourglasses in order to be taken and used. The number of coins varies from 0 to 10, and the number of hourglasses varies between 0 and 3. So choosing which tiles we want in order to perform actions is another way we can manage our pocketbook as well as our time track. And we have one other method at our disposal for managing our time track. When we have to add two or three hourglasses to our time track, we have the option of using double hourglasses instead of single hourglasses. So recall in this uh, example here, we just paid two hourglasses in order to take that navigator action to build a temple city. But instead of adding two single hourglasses to our time track, we could have added just one double hourglass instead. Clearly, the advantages of doing so are obvious. However, there's a price to be paid. When the round is over, all of the action tiles on your player board are returned to the game board, and all of your single hourglass tokens are removed and returned to the supply. Your double hourglasses, on the other hand, get flipped over and are converted to single hourglasses, occupying your time track at the start of the next round. Therefore, when you choose to pay time with a double hourglass, in effect, you're borrowing one unit of time from your next round of play in order to spend that extra time this round instead. Deciding when you pay for time and whether you pay with single versus double hourglasses, that's another big part of the decision-making process of Gantis. Let's now take a look at the other sections of the player board. When we took that navigator action that allowed us to build a temple city on the map, one of its rewards might very well have been the ability to gain one temple cube on our player board. Those are represented over here on the far right. If we subsequently build more cities in the same region of the game board in future turns, we might be able to activate that temple city again and again producing more temple cubes. This cascading effect is part of what makes cities so valuable in the game. Similarly, building oracle cities often results in our accumulating oracle cubes in a similar fashion. These cubes serve an important purpose during the game. At any time during your turn, before, during, or after taking your main action, you have three special actions available to you at all times. First, you may spend a combination of three oracle and or temple cubes in order to increase your population by one person. Thus, I could spend three cubes, say, in order to increase my scholars by one. Secondly, you may spend one oracle cube at any time in order to make two exchanges of people within your population. For example, if I returned this oracle cube to the supply, I could then decrease my nobles by one and increase my artisans by one. So now I have one noble and five artisans instead of two and four. And I could also decrease my priests by one in order to increase my merchants by one. One oracle cube pays for two exchanges. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, if I don't quite meet the requirements of a card, I can substitute one temple cube for each person that I'm missing, 
up to a limit of four, obviously, since I only have place of space for four cubes, temple cubes, on my player board. So at present, <laughs> I no longer meet the requirements of Shrine because I'm missing one priest. In order to play Shrine to my, my tableau, I could forfeit a temple cube in order to pay for that missing priest. Let's examine each action now more closely. For purposes of example, let's say we had a trading post and a freeze card in our hand. Now, note that we, while we are currently meeting the people requirements of trading post, we have one noble, two merchants, and one scholar. We don't have a city. There's one additional requirement shown above here in trading post that says we need to have at least one temple city or one oracle city or one trading city to our name in order to play the trading post card to our tableau. In the case of freeze, we have the one scholar that we need, but we don't have any artisans and we don't have any soldiers. So right now, neither of these cards are playable for us. Note that if we were able to successfully play Trading Post, we'd score three victory points and we'd gain one artisan. That would get us one step closer to being able to play Freeze because, like I just said, Freeze needs one artisan and one soldier to be able to play it. So it's our turn. And let's say we have our eye on Winery and Shrine at opposite ends of the display. There's Shrine over here, and there's Winery over here. Let's suppose we wanted to perform a scribe action in order to add those two cards to our hand. Remember that there is a hand limit of three cards, but we won't have that limit tested until the decline phase at the end of the round, so it's okay right now if we wanted to have four cards in our hand. The scribe action tiles available to us include two tiles that cost six coins. This one, six coins in one hourglass, and this one, six coins in one hourglass. There's one tile that costs eight coins in two hourglasses, right here, a little hard to see. One tile that costs ten coins in two hourglasses. And finally, there's a less expensive card that costs eight coins and one hourglass. Obviously that tile's better than this one which costs eight and two hourglasses. So given the choice you would clearly want to take the better tile. How much we pay for the tile dictates how many and which cards we can take from the display. For example, if we paid for that tile that costs six coins and one hourglass we would either be able to take any one card from the six leftmost positions of the display. One card, if we had six bucks, if we paid six bucks for the tile, we could take any one card from any one of these positions, from winery up to council house. Or we could take any two cards from the four leftmost positions. Notice here, that we could pay six as long as we take two cards from between winery, monument, scriptorium, and road. Obviously, if we really wanted marketplace or council house or shrine for that matter, paying six coins to get two cards doesn't help us because every card to the right would be unavailable to us. And paying six cards to draw one card from council house down wouldn't help us because that wouldn't let us get two cards and it wouldn't let us get access to the shrine which is over here to the right. If we chose to pay six coins and one hourglass and decided say we wanted just to draw a marketplace from the display, well normally that would have cost us five coins but in this case we'd be overpaying by one coin. You don't get change in this game. That's just the way it is. We also have the ability, by paying six coins, to take one card of our choice from the Civilization discard pile that contains cards from earlier eras. That's indicated right here, paying six coins to take one card from the discard pile. 
Since we're currently in error 1, the discard pile is empty, so this option really isn't available to us. If we took the action tile that cost 8 coins and 1 hourglass, we could take any one of the cards in the display, because they're all priced at 8 or less, or we could take any two cards from the six leftmost positions because of this indicator right here. So we could pay eight coins to take any two of these six cards, but we wouldn't be able to take training ground or shrine. So if we went all out and paid ten coins and two hourglasses with this tile, we could take any two cards in the display because of this indicator here, or we could take any three cards from the four leftmost positions, because of this indicator here. In this case, we could pay ten and take three from among winery, monument, scriptorium, and road. Alternatively, if we paid ten coins, we'd also have the option of taking any two cards from the discard pile, if there was a discard pile. Now in our case, if we want to take winery and shrine, we are forced to take the tile that costs 10 coins and 2 hourglasses. That's the only way to draw 2 cards from the display all the way over here to the right. By the way, I'm not suggesting this is a particularly good play. I'm obviously just using it for purposes of example. So we take the tile costing 10 coins and 2 hourglasses and we add it to our time track. We also have to either add two single hourglasses or one double hourglass. So let's say we go for the double hourglass. Our time track would now look like this. Notice I've added the action tile itself. It's now gone from the game board, so now it's not available to anyone to take for the rest of this round. I paid my two hourglasses, this one was already there at the start of the game, and my coins are down from 20 to 10, as indicated by this little box here. Coins are obviously just tokens that you keep to the side of your player board when you're actually playing the game. So now we're able to add winery and shrine to our hand of cards. All of the other cards in this display are going to slide to the left and two new Era 1 cards will be added to the display. So there's Shrine and Winery. Every Shrine and Winery leave the display, cards shift to the left, and two new cards are revealed. In this case, Forge and Tenement. Now the other players in the game take their turns. Let's say that one other player took the Chronicler tile that cost two coins and one hourglass that one, right here, and maybe she used that to play a card from her hand. And let's say the third player in the game decided to take the new start player action tile right from here. Let's say she just didn't like being in third place. She won't become the new start player until the decline phase of this round. And in the meantime, the tile occupies one space on her time track. It cost her zero hourglasses, and she gains two coins. So there's a little incentive to taking the new start tile action, even though it doesn't give you something real until the next round. Uh, the fourth player in our fictional four-player game decides to take a tax collector action, which gains him eight coins, and in addition he has to pay two hourglasses for that benefit. There are actually no tax collector action tiles that ever get removed. You simply add the hourglass tokens to your time track. There is no action tile to add to your time track when you take a tax collector action. Okay, so now it's back to us. We need a city in order to play the trading post, so we decide to take a navigator action. We go up here and we decide to pay four coins and two hourglasses to build a trade city. So that tile gets removed from the player board, gets added to our time track, and again, let's say in this example we decided to go for another double hourglass. Note, by the way, I'm, I'm not going to bother tracking my coins from this point forward. Uh, let's just assume I have a rich uncle. 
We can build trade cities in any region to earn five coins. For example, there's a trade city here and there for five coins. There's a trade city here and here for five coins. And there's a trade city over here that would generate five coins for us as well. But we could also build a trade city in the green region that would score us two victory points and keep on scoring later on in the game, potentially. So we decide to go that route. We build the city of Miletus, putting one of our cities on that space, and we score two victory points. If we ever build another city in the green region, say in Trapezus over here, an oracle city, we not only gain an oracle cube for Trapezus, as indicated by this icon, but we also get to activate all of the other green region cities we have. So we would score another two victory points for Miletus at that time. Every time you build another city in a particular region, be it red, green, or yellow, you get to activate all of the cities in that region, including the city you just placed. Now, for purposes of the rest of this tutorial, I'm, not, I'm going to ignore the turns and the actions of the other three players in this fictional game of ours. For our next turn, we're ready to play our trading post because we now meet the requirements. We have one noble, we have two merchants, and we have one scholar, and we have the one city that we needed. In order to play the trading post, we need to perform a chronicler action. So we go over here and we see, well, okay, here's one that costs one coin and two hourglasses. Here's one that costs three coins and one hourglass. I think that one looks a little better. So let's take that one. Three coins and one hourglass. The action tile gets removed from the game board. The action tile gets placed on our play board time track, and we get the new single hourglass. Note that our time track is now full. So we're not going to be able to take any more turns during this round. Now you can see I played trading post in front of me face up to my tableau. We score three victory points for it, as indicated here. We gain one artisan, as indicated here. And I've also already recorded that one artisan uh, right here. And we also gain points for matching symbols on all the cards in our tableau. Anytime you play an era one or era two card to your tableau, you score one victory point for each matching symbol of one type that appears on the card you just played. Now in this case, this was our first card that we played to the tableau. So we would score one victory point, be it for this symbol or this symbol doesn't really matter but say in a future turn we decided to play oh how about shrine when we play shrine we'll be able to score one point for every symbol on every card in our tableau that looks like this so when we play shrine we'll score another one two victory points and then if a late in a later turn we played winery well, we wouldn't want to score for this symbol, but we'd want to score for this symbol, and we'd score three more points for that one, for that one, and for that one. So again, matching those symbols over time gains you more and more points. Now everyone is past, say, and it's time for the decline phase. In the decline phase, the following steps happen. The player whose time track contains the new starting player action tile takes the start player token. Recall that in our example, one of our opponents took that action tile. If any players used cubes to mark one-time actions, they'd return those cubes to the supply now. We'll talk about those special one-time actions later on. All players then clean up their time track by returning action tiles to the corresponding spaces of the game board. And they also return all single hourglass tokens to the supply and convert double hourglass tokens to single hourglass tokens, leaving them in place on the time track for the next round. So in my case, all of these action tiles are going to go back to the player board 
the single act uh, the single hourglass tokens are going to go away and the two double hourglass tokens are going to turn into two single hourglass tokens like so now you can see I've sort of made my situation worse by starting round two with two hourglass tokens blocking spaces on my time track instead of just one, which was what my situation was at the beginning of the game. Continuing on with the decline phase, the round marker advances to the next round. And in the case where we're advancing either to round three, the beginning of era two, or round five, the beginning of era three, we change the era. And during a change of era, all civilization cards of the old era are removed from the display. They're not removed from players' hands, only from the display, and they're moved to the discard pile. And cards from the new era deck are then laid out and displayed in their place. Furthermore, every player is allowed to return one blocking cube from their time track to the supply, thus providing them an additional space on their time track for the remainder of the game. If a player ever has the option to remove a blocking cube, but they previously removed all of them already, let's say because of an error change or because of playing a card like Shrine, if you didn't have any blocking cubes to remove, then you'd have the option of either adding one Temple cube or one Oracle cube to your player board. Each player in the newly established turn order now activates one of their cities in each of the three regions. One city in the red region, one city in the green region, and one city in the yellow region, assuming you've built in all three regions or any combination of those regions. In my case, I only have one city in the green region, so I would score another two victory points during the decline phase for that city. But if I also, say, had a trade city and a temple city on the two victory point space in the red region, and let's say I had a trade city in the yellow region, I would score the two victory points for Miletus. Then I'd either score two victory points or gain five points for the red region city of my choice. And lastly, I would gain five coins for the trade city that I had in the yellow region here. At this time, players also activate the decline phase abilities of all civilization cards in their tableau. In my case, as designated by this moon icon, I have the ability uh, granted to me by Trading Post to pay three coins for one victory point up to five times if I wanted to, and assuming I had the coins on hand to do so. And I would get that ability at the decline, during the decline phase of every subsequent round for the rest of the game. Finally, if any players had more than three cards in their hand, they would have to place one hourglass token on their time track for each card in excess over the limit of three. If a player had to take several hourglasses, he'd be able to choose to place single and or double hourglasses to compensate for the excess cards but hopefully you don't have more than three, or let's say at worst, four cards in your hand. Um, but sometimes you want to have four cards and pay that one hourglass penalty because the cards are so good and you wanted to get them before somebody else did. Okay, so that's the decline phase. We haven't talked about the philosopher action, so let's see how that works now. If you pay one to four coins for the philosopher action tile, let's say, well, all of you, obviously all of these action tiles cost at least four coins, but let's say you took this one that cost exactly four coins and one hourglass, you would then be able to increase your population by one of any six types. Or, because you paid four coins, you'd be able to increase your population by two from among those displayed in the first two columns. So this works similarly to the way the scribe action worked in drawing cards from the display. So you could see that by paying four coins in this first row, we could uh, draw, uh, we could train any one person, or by paying four coins for the action tile, we could train the soldier twice, the priest twice, 
or the priest wants and the soldier wants. Now, it just so happens that uh, I need a priest for winery over here, and I need a soldier for both shrine and freeze here. After completing the training, the person that I trained who was farthest to the right would shift to the back of the line, followed by anyone else I trained in descending order. So in the case, let's say I did decide to train one priest and one soldier, the soldier would move all the way to the end of the line first, and then the priest would move the end of, to the end of the line after the soldier, and so the final uh, layout of the tiles, after doing all that, would be scholars in the first position, nobles in the second position, then merchants, followed by artisans, followed by the soldier tile, then finally followed by the priest tile. I said if you paid one to four coins for the philosopher ta action, you'd be able to increase your population by one of different types of people in the display. But I didn't actually say how you could spend less than four coins since the lowest valued action tile here is four coins. Well, the card freeze that we already have in our hand is a good example. Let's take a look at that up close. Once this card is played to my tableau, I have the option once per round when it's my turn to not take an action tile from the board, but instead to mark this card with a cube and pay one hourglass, as indicated by this space here, and two, more, two or more coins of my choice to take a philosopher action. Now there are multiple advantages for me to do it this way. Number one, I don't have to place an action tile on my time track, so that saves me a space. Number two, I can perform this action even if the other action tiles on the board had been previously removed. And notice, there are only four action tiles here to choose from, so it's pretty easy for those tiles to get scooped up in any particular round of play. And finally, I could choose to pay whatever I want, from two to eight coins, depending on the type of philosopher action I wanted to perform. So in the example, uh, say, if I wanted to increase my population, oh, by one priest and one scholar, I could pay exactly five coins. Five coins lets me train from this column to the left, and I pay one hourglass in order to do that. And on the other hand, if all I wanted to do, say, was train one artisan, the artisan is over here, I could pay exactly four coins to do that, the way I normally would if I played with a normal action tile. But having the choice is nice. If I wanted to train, say, a soldier and a noble, I could get away paying six coins exactly and one hourglass. A card like Alter, which I'm going to bring up now, has a similar ability on it. Once per round, if Alter was played to my tableau, I could pay four to ten coins and one hourglass in order to perform a scribe action. So say if I wanted to grab Council House and Marketplace, well, if I wanted those two, all I have to pay is seven coins to do so. So by marking this with a cube, I could pay exactly seven coins and one hourglass to do that. If I didn't have this card and I was, uh, if I was stuck having to take an action tile, best I could do would, have to t would be to take this action tile, which would cost me eight coins and two hourglasses instead of seven coins and one hourglass. So clearly having cards with benefits like this are really nice to uh, have uh, in your tableau. What happens when you build a city up here in the upper left-hand area of the board? This is called the hometown area. Let's say I decided to build a temple city in the third row, just like that. Now, that would be an alternative to playing a temple city or some other kind of, well, depending upon the action tile, some other kind of city down here on the map. But by playing a 
a, a city, by building a city up here in the hometown area, I would then be able to activate all of my cities in any one region of my choice. Remember, if I build a city in a region, I get to activate all of the cities in that region. But by building a city in the uh, hometown area, I get to uh, resolve all of the abilities of all of my cities in any one region of my choice, be it the red region, the green region, or the yellow region. Of course, if I haven't built any cities in the map, on the map, that doesn't do me any good. Furthermore, once per round, I could place a cube on that city, like so, to mark it in order to either activate this special benefit here or this special benefit here. These are not action tiles that get removed from the board. These are all special benefits attributed to having uh, hometown cities in these particular rows. So for example, if I mark this city in order to take this benefit, this benefit allows me to then take subsequently a, a philosopher action in the normal fashion, but I would also get to be able to gain one additional person of my choice. Now that doesn't, taking that, using that ability doesn't let me actually take the philosopher action. I have to do that in a normal fashion by taking a tile here, or uh, using a, a card like Freeze in my uh, Tableau, for example. But by combining those two actions, and the, the, these uh, activating these cities up here in the hometown area don't, call, don't actually end my turn. They only supplement another, my main action that I'm about to follow it with. So by activating that, say in my previous example, when I paid, uh, I think it was five coins to train a scholar and a priest, I could, uh, by activating the city, I could pay the five coins, uh, using freeze, for example, to train ooh, a scholar, a priest, and maybe a soldier, or maybe two priests, uh, two priests and a scholar, or maybe three priests, whatever the case may be. Normally, paying five coins limits me to training two people from this column to the left. By activating this ability, I'm now able to train a third person from this column to the left. Alternatively, let's say I wanted to activate this ability instead by marking this city with a cube. This ability then lets me take a tax collector action and earn the coins I would otherwise earn a second time. So, for example, if I activated this city and said I wanted to use this ability, I would then pay my two hourglasses or my single double hourglass and, and I would earn 16 coins instead of eight. There are cards that have ongoing abilities that let you do the same thing and all these things are stackable. So I could potentially have, let's say, two cities in row three. I could activate both of them using this ability, activate the special ability in, on the card that's permanent in my tableau, and in that example, that's one, two, three, four times eight. I would be earning 32 coins. That would do me well for oh, a long period of the game, and uh, I wouldn't have to worry about money for uh, quite some time. Generally speaking, though, it's nice to have money engines going in the game where you've got, uh, I, don't, I haven't shown any of those cards, but there are cards that say during the decline phase, for every scholar you have, you'll earn two coins. Or for every artisan you have, you'll earn two coins. So having some of those cards in your tableau are also a nice way to supplement your income because otherwise there's no easy way to get money short of adding hourglasses to your to your time track. The hometown abilities in row two over here are also associated with philosopher actions. The first ability here lets me simply take a philosopher action as if it were as if I was taking this action tile but since this action tile doesn't really exist I can activate this ability uh, by paying four coins and one hourglass, but I don't actually have to place an action tile on my time track, so it saves me space. This hometown ability here, by activating a city, would allow me to subsequently take 
a philosopher action in a normal in the normal fashion. It doesn't actually by itself let me take a philosopher action, but by activating this city, uh, activating this ability for one of my cities in row two, I could then spend anything I wanted from one to eight coins in order to perform the exact philosopher action I wanted to perform. So how would this work? Well, let's say I had one city in row two. I would activate this ability by marking that city, and then I'd either take a cube from here, an, a tile from here, or let's say I had freeze in my tableau, I could activate that space to take a philosopher action. Or let's say I had two cities in row two, I could activate one of them to actually take the philosopher action here, and activate the other city to get the ability to pay exactly how much I wanted to in addition to the action tile I was taking, which would normally be, in the case of a philosopher action, one hourglass. So I could say, do that and that, and um, I would end up paying four coins and one hourglass, but I would, have to, I would actually have my choice of paying whatever I wanted to because I had activated this ability here. So I could pay one coin to activate, to train, let's say in this example, one priest, or I could pay two coins to, if I wanted to activate one um, uh, scholar, or I could decide to pay six coins if I wanted to activate two nobles or and or scholars and or soldiers and or priests. And all of these are stackable. So if I had a city here that was unmarked and two cities here that were unmarked, I could activate all three of these philosopher actions, pay whatever amount I wanted to between one and eight plus the one hourglass, and then take three people from the train three people instead of just two people. The abilities here in row one work the same way, uh, except in the case of the scribe action. So this ability, if I had a city in this row, would allow me to take a scribe action that would cost me four coins and one hourglass, which is cheaper than any of the other action tiles here, you, know, you might notice. And if I activated this ability here, I could choose to pay exactly one to eight coins in addition to doing whatever I did to take the actual action, the actual scribe action, one hourglass, and take whatever cards I wanted to. So let's say I had two cities here that were unactivated. I could activate them both to use this ability and this ability, and maybe I wanted to pay three coins and one hourglass to take both the scriptorium and the monument. You notice I can take two, two cards by playing three coins from this position to the left is better than saying paying six coins and one hourglass, or worse, if that tile wasn't available, paying eight coins and two hourglasses to accomplish the same thing. There's a bonus to be earned if you ever play your eighth card to your tableau. These are the bonuses down here. Your eighth card to the tableau, or training your 18th person, or placing your sixth and final city. Now, if you've placed all six cities, by the way, and you want to build another city, you always have the option of relocating one city from one place on the board to another. But right now, I'm talking about these bonuses. If you're the first person to play your eighth card to your tableau or train your 18th person or to tr or place your sixth city, you're going to score eight bonus victory points. If you also, if somebody else also achieves that same ability, but they're not the first, they're only going to score four victory points. They get something for achieving the feat, but they don't get to get the full eight points for being the first person to do so. And that's about it. I haven't covered every rule in the book. Um, for example, I haven't, I haven't covered endgame scoring. I haven't indicated that you always have to take an action when it's your turn, or you pass, but you can't just say, I don't want to take an action this turn. Uh, I haven't 
talked about setup when playing in a two or three player game because in those cases certain action tiles are removed from the board before the game even begins in order to tighten up the game and if you're playing a two player game the yellow region is completely off limits again to further tighten up the board and furthermore there are other rewards offered by civilization cards that I haven't covered here rewards that include things like being able to build a city for free without actually getting the reward at that time for doing so. This tutorial has pretty much covered all the important aspects of playing Gentis. Only around 1,000 copies of the game were printed earlier this year, but there's a Kickstarter coming out on January 12th that's offering a deluxe version of the game. So check it out if this sounds like a game that's your cup of tea. I certainly love it, and I don't even own the game yet. I just programmed it on my computer. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed this uh, succinct introduction, relatively succinct introduction to the game of Gentis. Bye for now.